I'm just going live. Now, where is the Zoom window? I'm just going live. Okay, now you're live. Hey. Now. Okay, we have uh, Dr. Rajiva Srivastava, who is at Bonn currently. She worked under the, the she got a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, working with Adriel Seeger, and uh, she is currently at the National Institute of Bonn. We also won uh, the best award for the best thesis uh, from the Association of Women in Mathematics. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me, even if I cannot be there in person, it's still nice to meet you all virtually. Uh, and thank you for the to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the Kurani spherical maximal function on Heisenberg groups. <clears throat> so the title contains a lot of terminology and my idea for the talk is like in the first half, we, we will hopefully try to understand what each of these things mean. So what is a Kurani sphere? What is a spherical maximal function? And why Heisenberg groups? And then uh, we will talk about the main question and the theorem that I want to talk about. And uh, go over the broad aspects of the problem uh, on Heisenberg group. And uh, hopefully in the final 10 minutes, I'll also be able to talk about some nice counter examples, which help to show that the theorem that I'm going to talk about is sharp and there'll be some nice pictures there. Okay, so let's start. Uh, okay, uh, so what's the motivation? So uh, I'm going to talk about spherical maximal operators, and I work in this area called harmonic analysis, where maximal operators are quite ubiquitous. They keep appearing in different forms, and uh, maybe uh, some of us have, are familiar with this one maximal function, which is quite basic in analysis, also in number theory, the hardy littlewood maximal function. Uh, and this maximal function uh, is associated with taking averages of a function over balls. So, and when does it come up? Often, I mean, at least the first time I saw it was during the proof of the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. What does the Lebesgue differentiation theorem says? Pretty much the idea is that if you have a function, f of x, so you have a function on R d, and then uh, we expect that provided it's a nicely behaved function, and uh, let's keep the term nice way, uh, it, uh, if we keep averaging the function on balls, so suppose you have a point x and you keep averaging the function, so this is not a sphere right now, it's a ball. Uh, then, and uh, so you average the function at, at this ball of a certain radius center at x, and now you keep shrinking these balls, so keep making it smaller and smaller around still at the point x. We expect that eventually this average of the function over these balls should converge to the value of the point of the function at that point, if the function is nicely behaved. It's not too unpredictable. And indeed, uh, for uh, con if a function is, say, continuous, it's easy to see that, that this is, it does indeed happen. Uh, but now, what about functions which might not be as nice? So, for example, if you have an LP function, would this still happen? And uh, the Lebesgue differentiation theorem says, yes, it still happens. Except for maybe, uh, so it will happen for all points x except for a set of measure zero. Uh, but the way you do it is uh, you often convert this result, which is about pointwise convergence, to a study of an equivalent maximal operator. So in this case, the maximal operator that you would look at would be a supremum over all these averages pointwise. And you, what you want to study is you want to study that operator as a map on LP spaces. And if you're able to prove, and the there's a maximal principle which says that if you if you already have a point, nice pointwise behavior on a nice subclass of functions, here, those are continuous functions, and you get a nice uh, LP boundedness result on the associated maximal operator, then you can also, uh, then combining those two, you can actually get a nice pointwise behavior 
for all functions in the LP class. So these are the kind of maximal operators that I want to look at. So basically you have a nice object. In this case, it's a ball and you're averaging your function over that ball centered at a point and you take supremum, uh, a point by supremum over these balls. So this balls are sets of full Lebesgue -like measure, but we can also talk about taking averages of functions over more singular objects. And by singular, I mean maybe manifolds of intermediate dimension. So on one hand, you can have a hypersurface, which is a manifold of co-dimension one, or to the other extreme, if you are averaging your function on curves, which is a very singular object, it's of, it's of a dimension one, or manifolds of intermediate dimension. And with these averages, the idea is the more the co-dimension of the surface, uh, so the more singular it is, the harder the analysis gets. Uh, but uh, beyond this point-wise behavior, the idea also is that averages, whether over balls or more singular objects, should smoothen your functions out in some ways. So uh, maybe your function has some kinks at certain points, but if you keep averaging it over a nice surface, then ultimately that those kinks should not matter. And there are various ways to maybe see the smoothening effect. Uh, and today, this, uh, the smoothening effect that uh, the way we would measure the smoothening effect would be via these LP spaces. So a very mild idea, maybe not the usual idea, but uh, so an LP space is a space where basically if you take the absolute value of a function and raise it to the power P and integrate, that's still finite. And the idea is the higher the value of P, the more, the greater the power you raise your function to. So it should prevent your function from forming kinks or you know going very high at, abruptly at a lot of places because if it did go very high, then yeah. even if, uh, then your function would, uh, uh, you, uh, for higher values of p, uh, this would uh, uh, raising that uh, uh, that those kings to would raise uh, those kings to even higher powers, and the the LP norm would not be finite. That's the idea. So uh, uh, what we would be looking at are these averages of a function over surface over the sphere, as we would see. Uh, and uh, look at the associated maximal function and see what kind of smoothening effect it has on my function in terms of these LP spaces. So uh, the first one we would talk, uh, the first operator we would look at is time spherical maximal function. So this is associated, to, uh, this is a pretty classical object and this is associated to uh, averaging of functions over spheres. This is a Euclid in, in the Euclidean setting. This is what Stein looked at and why sphere? So the, if you look at hypersurfaces, the first object to consider would be a sphere, because as it happens in a lot of problems in harmonic analysis, curvature plays a really, really important role. And uh, I mean, if you are looking at a hypersurface, the, the most curvy hypersurface is the sphere. So that's why the sphere. And then we will also look, so I'll briefly now talk about the Euclidean spherical maximal function, and then try to talk about the analog in the Heisenberg case, which is what we would focus on in the talk today. So yeah, so the story starts with the Euclidean spherical maximal function. So you take an RD, you take the sphere now, not the ball, but the sphere uh, in RD, and uh, the measure you can have, uh, you can take the normalized surface measure on the sphere. And now the operator I'm looking at for initially, I just defined the averaging operator. So uh, A is for the average, and the subscript T, which will play an important role la later, denotes the radius. So uh, radius is T for me. So the role of the averaging operator AT, what does it do? It takes my function F as an input, and then it returns the output function. And what is the, what is the value of the output function at a point X? It simply returns the average of my function F uh, on a sphere centered at the point X and of radius T. That's all that's happening. And if you write it out, this is how it looks like. This is this convolution with this measure. Uh, so this is averaging at uh, on over a sphere of radius t, but I keep saying maximal operator. So what's the maximum here? So uh, for me, factor m is the global maximal operator. I want to take a supremum over uh, over averages over spheres of all possible radii. So here I take a pointwise supremum over averages uh, uh, over a radii all radii greater than zero. Right? And I call it global because I'm looking at uh, the supremum extends to radii of all scales, right? Uh, so this was the, opt so you, you take the average of a sphere and then you take a pointwise supremum. Now this operator can behave very badly. 
So Stein studied this uh, maximal operator and he wanted to investigate the LP boundedness of this factor M, the global maximal operator, because again, he wanted to prove a pointwise result about like an equivalent of the Lebesgue differentiation theorem, but for spheres. And he was able to show that in dimensions d greater than or equal to three, this operator is bounded on LP, but not for all P between one to infinity, but for P strictly greater than D over D minus one. So it depends on the dimension. And this range is also sharp up to end points. So even at P equals D over D minus one, LP boundedness fails. Now you see that this, uh, so this is good. Volume. Is there a question? Oh. No, no. Okay. Volume is to reduce. Uh, so, uh, okay, so now this result is only in dimensions d greater than or equal to three. Now, why not in two, in the planar case, what happens? So if you look in the planar case, d equals to two, uh, this range is p strictly greater than two, which is bad because L2 space is a really nice space. But for d equals to two, this space is excluded. Uh, L2 space is the only LP space, which is Hilbert, you have Planchville, other things. So um, uh, it was, uh, and Stein really used these L2 methods to prove his result in dimensions t greater than or equal to three. So it took 10 years till Bogat was able to extend uh, the result of the case d equals to two as well and the sharp range p strictly greater than two. And his methods were very geometric. So he was looking at intersections of circles and how they intersect and using bounds on those to do it rather than appealing to L2 methods. So this is about the global maximal operator. And then later, uh, uh, this results were also simplified and extended to variable coefficient setting for general Fourier integral operators by Mokan, Hopp, Siga, and Sog. Uh, so this is all about the global maximal operator. Now, I, I, I keep talking about the smoothening effect. So what about LP to LQ estimates for Q greater than P? Uh, now, you cannot really ask for such estimates. So LP to LQ. Fourier is not a Fourier-like operator, is it? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to. Is the maximal operator a Fourier-like operator? Or... Uh, so, is the maximal uh, operator a Fourier multiplier is what he's asking. Uh, I mean, for the averaging operator, you can talk about the Fourier multiplier, but then uh, when you take the maximal operator, uh, uh, no, I was just wondering, you went from Bourguin to this. Stein? Sure. Right, right. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, I mean, the Fourier integral operator techniques uh, are also available for like a wider range of operators. And uh, uh, so the, the, their paper all, as a special case would also apply to this averaging of the spherical maximal operator as well. So is that your question? Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, it's a bit, uh, sometimes not able to hear. Um, uh, okay, uh, right. And then, so for LP to LQ estimates, you cannot really ask for those for the global maximal operator because if P and Q are set, are different on both sides, you cannot really sum things up across different scales. It will not work, but you can still ask that for at a single scale. So for the local maximal operator, which I'll denote by Roman M, and this is for T between one to two, so here, by local, I mean the radius is at a local scale for t between 1 to 2. Okay, And this, uh, so the LP to LQ mapping properties of this operator was studied by Schlag and then Schlag and Sorg, and they were able to establish almost sharp LP to LQ estimates for this operator. So this is a story for the um, Euclidean maximal operator, but we are in the Heisenberg setting. So... Uh, Quick introduction. So, what's the Heisenberg group? It's a non commutative and non compact Lie group. Uh, it's null potent of step two. So, uh, I mean, the Heisenberg uh, group is also quite well known. It occurs in quantum mechanics and complex analysis. Uh, in harmonic analysis, it's nice because it's a nice testing ground for your theorems. You, you have a, a, a lot of techniques you can use in the Euclidean setting to prove theorems. Uh, but then you might ask, okay, can I extend it to a non-Euclidean uh, space? So the first testing round is often the Heisenberg group, because in some senses, it's like the most Euclidean of non-Euclidean examples. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit. 
But uh, so the idea is a lot of the results you have already in the eukaryotic space, you should be able to, a lot of times you should be able to extend it to the Heisenberg group, but you might, you would have to use different techniques. So that uh, uh, really, so the rich structure of the Heisenberg group really gives you the possibility of proving counterparts of results from the eukaryotic setting. And like, it really gives a nice set of open problems for, for example, I was a PhD student, so it was nice to just have these problems to think about. And today's talk would be about estimates for an analog of the spherical maximal function, but on Heisenberg groups. And I will not really be going into any details, but uh, it was really nice to see that we, we were able to use the theory of oscillatory integral operators, which is still coming from the Euclidean case, but in the Heisenberg setting to actually prove sharp results in this setting as well. So that's the idea. So what is the Heisenberg group? As I said, it's a Lie group. So it's a manifold, it's dimension. So uh, maybe a word about the notation. When I say Hn, uh, you should, the dimension of the Heisenberg group is 2n plus 1. Okay, so not n, but 2n plus 1. It's always odd dimensional. So 3, 5, 7. Uh, and uh, uh, when you uh, look at it as a, so it's a, a nil potent Lie group. So uh, the exponential map from the Lie algebra to the Lie group is a diffeomorphism. So that really allows you to use these exponential coordinates to uh, work on the Heisenberg group. And uh, uh, you can just take, if you want, you can just take this as the starting definition of the group law on the Heisenberg group. It just comes from the Baker uh, 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 Gamble Weiss formula. So uh, uh, basically, what will happen when you look at the Heisenberg group is you have these 2n plus 1 coordinates. In the first 2n coordinates, you don't really see any change in the group law. Okay. So if you were to, but it's in the last coordinate that you see a twist come in. Uh, so this it's this one coordinate that changes things, but it's this one coordinate. So that's why in some sense I feel like it's just one step ahead of the of the Euclidean things, at least as a group. So uh, um, what is the group law? So what I would do is I would split any element x in the Heisenberg group in this manner. The first two n coordinates where you won't see a change, I will refer by x under bar. So it's a two n dimensional vector. The last coordinate would be x d which is where the change will come. And what's the group law? It's what I underlined right now. So first two n coordinates will simply add up. But in the last one, you have this twist coming. So you have xd plus yd plus a bilinear form, which again involves the first two n coordinates. Okay, so this is the twist. And this bilinear form is given by a two n dimensional matrix J, which is this standard symplectic matrix up to this factor one half. But I'll kind of forget about this in the slides later. So uh, if you want to write it out, for example, when n equals one, this is how the group law looks like. The first two coordinates, nothing, ch no change. But in the last one, this extra twist comes in. It will make the product non-commutative. And this twist really affects a lot of things, even in the problem that we would look at. Uh, so that's, that's something interesting. So uh, this is what you should keep in mind. OK, so now I've uh, defined the Mm, the setting. Uh, now, what's the what's the analog of a sphere on the Heisenberg group? To define a sphere, I need a norm, uh, which is a good norm to consider on the Heisenberg group. So now, on the on in the Euclidean case, your sphere is defined with respect to the standard Euclidean norm, and it's homogeneous, right, with respect to the dilation structure on the Euclidean in the on in Rn. So I would like to have a norm which is also a uh, 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 um, which is also homogeneous with respect to the dilation structure on the Heisenberg group. But what is the dilation structure on the Heisenberg group? It's non-isotropic, it's parabolic, and it's easy to see why. Again, you have the group law. So by a natural dilation structure, I mean a dilation which is automorphic with respect to the group law that you have. Uh, so it's easy to see that if I multiply the first two coordinates by t, the uh, in the product, the coordinates also get multiplied by t, but in the twist, that will have a t square because you get a t from both x and y. So you have to, in order to have that homogeneity, you have to multiply the last coordinate by t square. So the natural dilation structure is parabolic in nature. So the simplest one you can take is t t squared. And the norm I would consider is one which should be, uh, which should be homogeneous of, with respect to this dilation structure. So I would look at the Karani norm, which is something people 
uh, have considered uh, I have considered a lot. And so this is uh, so to accommodate for that different dilation structure. Uh, this is how it looks like. In the first two n coordinates, you take the length and raise it to the power four. But the last coordinate is a square, uh, and then to the power one fourth. So because of the difference in powers, uh, this would be homogeneous of degree one with respect to this parabolic dilation. So that's the norm that I'd look at. Again, the 16 is here to make this norm actually a norm, but again, I will kind of forget about it in the slides. So now we have the um, we have the Heisenberg group, we have the norm, what's, what's, then we can define the sphere uh, of radius one with respect to this norm. So we have the Karani sphere right here, but uh, unlike the Euclidean sphere, it's not quadratic throughout. There's a degree four term. But okay. You do expect it to be flatter because the order of contact of the tangent space would be higher. And this is what you get. So uh, if you if you plot at least in dimensional sphere, the Kurani sphere uh, um, uh, centered at the origin, this is how it looks like. Uh, around the equated sway curve, like you expect your sphere to be, but around the poles, it gets flatter like an apple. So, uh, and as I said in the first slide, curvature is very important in these problems. So the lack of curvature, you do expect it to influence your analysis. So that's something to watch out for here and we'll see how. Okay, now we have the Korani sphere. Okay, we have the Heisenberg group, we have the Korani sphere, we play the same game, we define the average and operator. And the measure we can take is the Haar measure induced on the sphere. Uh, so you have the averaging operator AT, T subscript denotes the radius, X denotes the center. So what is, does it do to my function? It simply returns the average of my function centered at the point X in the Heisenberg group around uh, 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 average of my function uh, on a Kurandi sphere of radius T centered at the point X on the Heisenberg group. When you write it out, uh, this is how this convolution with this measure looks like. So the convolution is the Heisenberg convolution, right? So in the first two n coordinates, you do see the usual convolution, but in the last one, the twist will come in uh, because of the Heisenberg group translation. And you also see a T squared because of the dilation, but the twist is more important. So this is what, this is the object that I'm looking at, at, at the averaging operator. And again, uh, you can look at the global maximal operator here, which is like a pointwise supremum, uh, and ask about LP boundedness. This was studied by Cowling in 81, and he proved an analog of Stein's result here. So uh, 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 this is LP bounded for all P greater than uh, this value. And this is also true for N equals one. Uh, okay, so now I'm giving a talk about Heisenberg group. So of course, uh, I mean, Professor Thangalu's name would come up. So he has worked a lot on this. And very recently in 21, Thangavelu and student Ganguly, they considered the local max, uh, the, uh, a single averaging operator associated with the Korani sphere. And what they wanted, they looked at were LP to LQ estimates for just this single averaging operator, and they got a nice result. Uh, and let me just say that their ultimate aim was, uh, uh, was went farther than that. They wanted to use something called sparse bounds uh, to uh, convert these local result for a sing uh, uh, for a single average to some kind of some new estimates on the lacunary maximal function where you take a supremum over lacunary radii. So uh, I mean, uh, this is just a very brief remark to say that they they did more than this, but this was this was the most crucial ingredient in the proof. Okay. Uh, so this is about the state of the art for the Qurani uh, maximal function till now. And now what are we gonna look at today? So we are going to look at the local maximal function associated to averages on these Qurani spheres. So su supremum over a single scale, and you're looking at these averages. So, and the question we want to look at, are what are the optimal LP to LQ estimates for this operator M? And here it's a, it's a, so these kind of results are called LP improving estimates. Uh, so uh, Q is greater than or equal to B. In fact, Q has to be greater than or equal to B for these kind of results to be true. So uh, this is the question that we want to look at today. And uh, again, you can use, if you are able to answer this, you, it also has implications for sparse bonds for the global maximal operator. So all supremo, all radii, not just lacunary. And, uh, 
Let me just say that the method that I'll briefly discuss today will also yield uh, sharp LP to LQ estimates for the single average operator. So I talked about this Ganguly Thangavelu result for the single average. So they had a nice result, but it was not sharp. Our method also gives a sharp result for this uh, for the averaging of uh, for for the averaging uh, for a single average as well. So, but the focus would be on this object. So, and this is the question that we want to look at. You need Q strictly bigger than P, is it? Oh uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, Q equal to P uh, also, but that is then just uh, LP boundedness, which Cowling already did for the uh, global maximal operator. So, the interesting question to answer would be for Q greater than P. Okay, so, um, right. So let now, this is the question. So what's the theorem? Uh, so I will give the statement of the theorem in a bit, but it's nice to first visually see it. And so the question is, okay, for every value of P, how far can I stretch Q? How far can I go, right? If I want to prove a sharp, almost sharp result, uh, so the way to plot it is, okay, have P on the x-axis and Q on the y-axis and then see how far you can go and you get a region. Uh, the interpolation works with the reciprocals of the exponents though. So we, I'll, we, I'll show a plot which has one over P on the x-axis and one over Q on the y-axis. And this is uh, the answer that we were able to provide to this question. So you see this region, it's a quadrilateral with two points on the diagonal. So this is uh, so you have one over P on the X axis, one over Q, Q on the Y axis. So this is for P equals Q, this is LP boundedness. Then you have a third point on the anti-diagonal. So where one over Q is one minus one over P and then a fourth point. And our theorem says that if one over P, one over Q lies in the interior of this quadrilateral in the shaded region, then your this operator is bounded from LP to LQ for those P and Q. Our result is also sharp because it says that it also says that if one OP, one OQ lie in the exterior of this quadrilateral, then that LP to LQ boundedness will fail. So we come up with counter examples to show that each of these edges cannot really be breached. So that's our result. I mean, which still leaves open questions at the endpoints, but it's sharp up to endpoints. Uh, and this is a convex region, which is not surprising because you have these interpolation uh, results, right? So uh, what we often do when proving these kind of estimates is uh, you, if you have a nice a positive result at one P and Q, and then also on another P2 and Q2, then you can interpolate between them and you also have a positive result in the middle. So uh, you, of course, this such a region would be quite, uh, would be a uh, would be convex. Uh, and then that pretty much allows us to concentrate on estimates around these four endpoints, uh, these vertices, because if even, and in fact, uh, you have certain stronger interpolation results, which even if you have some weak type uh, results at the endpoints, you can interpolate between them to get LP to LQ in the middle, in the region. So uh, the important estimates of uh, what you focus on are these uh, are these four vertices. That's pretty much the idea. So, and this is the main theorem. Uh, so this was recently published in Mathematics Annals last year. So our theorem is only for n greater than or equal to two, n equals one, Q1, Q2, Q3 are still true but we don't have any Q4, uh, things don't work out. So um, yeah, uh, and uh, so this is pretty much the representation of the picture I showed you earlier. You have uh, uh, two points on the diagonal, one on the anti-diagonal and then a fourth point and one OP, one OK in the interior of this quadrilateral, you have LP to LP boundedness, exterior the boundedness fails. And uh, the diagonal results, as the question was asked, is not really new. It's pretty much Cowling's result, essentially. Uh, but the off-diagonal estimates are new, and they are sharp. So we also have examples to show. OK, I think I'm a bit with my time. Uh, right. So 
Now, what I would like to do is talk a bit about the main ideas of the proof. So I'll not really be going into a lot of details, but pretty much what are the main features of the problem which make it different from the Euclidean case and uh, are they good? Are they bad? And you see that sometimes they help you, but sometimes they you have to do. Uh, um, uh, sometimes there are obstructions which you need to overcome to get the result. Um, but what are the key estimates that we are after in these in these uh, in this problem? So I said pretty much focus on those vertices. But even among those vertices, there are two estimates which are important. So let me go back to the picture. This was what we had. Uh, what will happen essentially is that uh, you have your op you will take your operator and decompose it into a uh, sum uh, of uh, into a sum of into a family of operators, maybe uh, denoted by the parameter k. And the idea is to look at each of these operators separately and get some nice estimate with maybe some kind of nice dk in k for LP to LQ estimates and then sum it up. That's the idea. I'm not getting into details of what exactly the parameter is or how you decompose. So then uh, this point is pretty much an uh, L infinity to L infinity estimate, whereas this would be an L1 to L1 estimate. So usually for maximal operators, getting L infinity or L1 estimates are not hard. It's just, uh, are they good enough? They are usually just uniform in the parameter, whatever the parameter is K, okay? So you don't have a DK in the parameter, uh, and that means that you can't really sum things up. So, okay, you don't have any DK. Where do you, can you hope to get a DK? Where can you hope to get a very nice estimate at this middle point, which is L2? Okay, so the most crucial estimate actually uh, is an, uh, or what, two, there are two crucial estimates, and one of them is this L2 estimate. So, uh, what we ultimately focus on are, is getting a nice L2 to L2 estimate for each of these pieces of the operator. And then uh, if there's a very nice DK, you can sum it up easily. And that nice DK also affords you the possibility to interpolate because you don't have any DK here. You If you get a lots of DK here, then you can just interpolate and see how far you can go. And turns out that this direction, uh, the, the DK you get over here is good enough. But in this direction, you can go all the way up to L infinity. But in this direction, you can only go up to Q2. And that turns out to be sharp though, so it's good. So, uh, and the same thing can be done on the anti-diagonal because you can also get an L1 to L infinity estimate kind of cheaply. It's not good, but you can get it and then you can interpolate. So you go up to Q3 as well. So for Q1, Q2 and Q3, the main estimate is actually an L2 estimate. And I'm not really telling what exactly the writing things out, but that's the idea. And uh, then you have to do something for Q4 where it's not, the L2 estimate, which helps you, you have to really do something at Q4 to get it. Uh, so the key estimates turn out to be two, an L2 estimate and the estimate at Q4. The way they also differ is for the L2 estimate. So remember, I keep talking about this averaging operator and I keep carrying this T, right? Uh, now, uh, your T is only going from one to two. We are looking at the local maximal operator. So, uh, uh, you can actually convert uh, often uh, these questions if you want from maximal operator to either look at the single averaging operator and trivially integrate over one to two stuff. So you can do something like that. Uh, but uh, as it happens for the L2 estimate, you don't even need to consider the, uh, the T variable. You can just look at the frozen averaging operator. So I'm not, I'm just looking at a single average and I'm studying the uh, mapping properties of that, and then just trivially integrate over one to two, and that would still give you a nice, the best estimate for the maximal operator as well, as it turns out. So you, the L2 estimate that you want is at fixed T, T for me is like the time. So a fixed time estimate turns out to be enough, which is really nice. And it already yields the, uh, and the uh, this L2 estimate depends on this fixed time curvature, whatever that means, but, and, it turns out that even though things are flat for the Qurani sphere, uh, this curvature is still present uh, in all directions. So it's just pretty nice. And this was actually already there in uh, a diploma bite of Oliver Schmidt, who was a student of uh, Detla Muller at Kiel. Uh, but, uh, and this already is enough to give you sharp estimates for the single averaging operator as well, which is what uh, Ganguly and Tanka Pele looked at. 
So this is one curvature that is important. The other estimate is a Q4 for which we would be looking at a different curvature, which also incorporates the T variable. So now you're not freezing your operator in time. You really have to look at the curvature of not just a single surface, but you need to look at uh, the curvature of a family of surfaces and see how they change as T varies. So it's like watching a movie. So this kind of curvature is called cinematic curvature. So this is not a fixed time estimate. And this does vanish at the pole state of flatness. So here, the Heisenberg group law doesn't help you. Uh, so you need to do something to still be able to get the optimal estimate. So these are the two estimates that we're after. And I said a lot of things. But maybe now we can examine the salient features of the problem uh, one by one uh, by uh, in light of these two estimates. Okay. So this would be a very soft discussion. But... Uh, so as I keep saying, one of the chief features is the flatness at the poles, right? So this was the equation of the Korani sphere that I showed you in maybe uh, one of the, in the beginning. And uh, uh, if you plot this equation, this is around, uh, this is the Korani sphere centered at the origin. So there's only y, x is zero. Uh, and this is the sphere that you get, okay? And it's flat. So it seems like there would be problems. But this is not a complete picture because you are just not you're not looking at the Quranic field just centered at the origin. You are moving things around, right? So you have to incorporate when you uh, if you look at the Quranic sphere centered at x at a generic point. So this equation corresponds to when x is zero. This is at a generic point x. So uh, this is the equation of the Quranic sphere. And why is this the equation of the Quranic sphere? Because the bilinear form comes in because of the, uh, of the Heisenberg group law. So uh, in the Euclidean case, if you have a sphere, whether you take it centered at the origin or you take it centered at X, it's the same sphere. You just move it around. The shape doesn't really change. But in the Heisenberg setting, we are in a variable coefficient setting. So things, the shape of, uh, because the group law is different, the shape of the sphere really changes when you move it around. So I don't have a nice animation or anything, but basically what happens is you have the Qurani sphere at the uh, origin. So this is flat, let me just draw 2D. But when you move it around, you keep start seeing the effect of this bilinear form, which is occurs in the quadratic term. When you move it around, you what you see is, you can actually plot it and see that it starts getting curvier, something like this at different points. So, um, it's a very vague uh, intuition that I'm giving, but essentially what uh, uh, you look at the defining equation of the Qurani sphere, <clears> and then it is inter very intimately connected to the mapping property of the corresponding oscillatory integral operator, because this is what will appear in the phase of that oscillatory integral operator. So when you look at its curvature, which would essentially amount to looking at the mixed derivatives of that, uh, this bilinear form really saves you in some way, at least for the fixed time. So, and this is only there because of the Heisenberg group law. So intuitively, you really have to see how the geometry of the uh, sphere and the Heisenberg group law play with each other. So we, in some sense, what ends up happening is we get additional curvature due to the Heisenberg setting because of the matrix J. And that really helps you for this fixed time curvature. You really get the curvature that you want. If not for this, so if you were just looking at the Korani sphere in the Euclidean case, you would not have that, that curvature anymore. So this is really nice. So that's a very soft argument as to why you get the fixed time curvature. So uh, the relevant curvature in the sense of commander is a rotational curvature. And this is uh, uh, because of the Heisenberg group, it actually is there and it allows you to give the best possible fixed time L2 estimates. So this is how you pretty much dealing with the L2 estimate that you want. Okay, so that's one thing. And then what about the estimate at Q4? As I said, now you need to consider the, uh, the curvature with T, the T variable as well. You need to incorporate it in the curvature that you're looking at. But this curvature, uh, essentially, in some sense, it's, uh, this curvature actually would involve third derivatives. Uh, and this curvature does vanish at the poles. Uh, so uh, this is the curvature which is affected by the flatness. And let me say, this is not really, this is something new for the Qurani sphere. This is not observed for the Euclidean spherical operator. And this 
happens because of the flatness of the Quranic sphere. Okay, so then what do you do to uh, to how to get around that obstruction? Uh, so we, you can see that the curvature would vanish at the pose, but you can uh, one needs to see, but one can see verify that around if you are once you are away from the pole, things are all good. So uh, you do then what you often do in harmonic analysis. You make a dyadic decomposition. So uh, you know things are fine away from the pole. Things go bad when you approach the pole. So you approach the pole in a controlled dyadic manner. So if you, you want to see a picture. So uh, this is my Quran sphere. It's curved here. It goes flat at the poles. So what I do is I keep making these pieces. Okay, things are really, really bad once I'm localized around the pole, but I can keep, I can uh, start uh, breaking my chronosphere up into these static pieces and approach the pole. And what happens is, uh, now what's the advantage of looking at these pieces? For each of these pieces, maybe it's, it's already looking curvy, but as you keep going towards the pole, it starts looking more and more flat. But the idea is that... Um, even if something looks curvy, uh, flat at single scale, you can zoom in and it will start looking curvy again. So maybe this piece already looks curvy, but this one maybe is a bit flat. So I zoom in further and it starts looking curvy again. This one still looks flat. I zoom in further and it starts looking curvy again. So that's that's the idea of scaling. And I mean, scaling is the is pretty much analytically what is doing the zooming. So. Uh, for each dyadic piece, you need to scale it back to a to a situation where uh, the uh, where the size or the distance from the pole is rescaled back to unit size, and that rescaling changes your operator. It's no longer the original operator. You get a rescaled piece, but that rescaled piece is now so that the curvature does not vanish. So you have hopes to prove estimates for that rescaled piece, and then once you do that you need to find a way back to your original operator. That's the idea of the scaling and the zooming in. And the zooming in is scaling. Um, but of course, this you cannot keep doing this. This will only work up to a certain distance from the pole. There will come a point after which, I mean, even for my tab, I can't really keep zooming in. So uh, it's like, it's the uncertainty principle essentially. So after some point, you can't really do things further. Things are flat. But that would only happen when you're already really, really localized around the pole. So you already have this very tiny piece. So you are that piece corresponds to convolution with a very small measure. So that you can gain it trivially there. So that's the idea uh, of scaling. And this idea, I mean, scaling is not new. Um, for example, yes, which use such an idea for families of flat curves and the plane. But now we are on the Heisenberg group and things are not as straightforward, again, because of this group law and in particular that bilinear form, the scaling argument needs to be modified and uh, let's see why. So, but this is the idea we want to use. We want to, uh, even if the curvature vanishes, we want to scale things back to unit curvature and then uh, uh, prove estimates there. So the idea which is which helps you uh, here is what I like to call in imbalance scaling. So uh, meaning that you have an input variable uh, y, y is like parameterizing the sphere, and output variable x, which is stands for the center of the sphere. And the correct scaling is one where these variables are scaled differently. Uh, so I have these very tiny calculations. Maybe I can show quickly. So uh, Imagine if you were in the Euclidean case. So this is slightly different. You pretty much use a Taylor expansion to parameterize your Quran sphere like this around the pole. So you see that degree four term come in. And if you were not on the Heisenberg group, then uh, uh, then they would uh, they, this bilinear form pretty much is not there. That's for me what makes the Heisenberg group Heisenberg group. Uh, and then it's pretty straightforward what scaling you want to use. You if you want to scale this term here uh, to unit scale, say you scale it by two to power negative, uh, the way to scale it is you scale x uh, by two to power negative l, y by two to power negative l, and then the uh, pretty much the last coordinate has to scale by the fourth power of that because of the way the homogeneity works. So it's straightforward, but the same scaling in the Qurani case would not was not helpful or I was stuck for a lot of time there because 
not only you have do you have a degree four term, but you also have this bilinear term because of the Heisenberg group. So if I was scaling x and y by the same factor two to the power negative l, here I would see a two to the power negative four l, but here I would see a two to the power negative two l, and then I was confused what I should keep, how should I scale the last coordinate, like for the longest time, what's going on, and then it took some time for me to realize that the current scaling in fact is one where you don't scale x and y variables in the same way. So uh, what you want here is a two to the power negative four as well. So the way to scale things is scale x by a third power and y by a, a single power. So this was the scaling which turned out to be the correct one. And then you do get the same fourth power everywhere. Things are fine. Of course, not exactly because you pay a price, you see this nasty thing still come in in front of the X variable here, which uh, creates problems. So you need to deal with that. But even then, this is the correct scaling to consider. So uh, again, this is just a cartoon calculation to show how things uh, are affected by the Heisenberg geometry or group structure. Okay, so again, but you do this properly, then you get estimates for the V-scale pieces by using the curvature properties. By you need to use some uh, 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 some theory for that, and then bring everything back to the non-scale pieces and have some things together and try to get an estimate. That's the idea. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say about the positive proof, and I think I'm. Uh, very soon running out of time. So maybe I will go very quickly about the um, how do you prove the negative result essentially or the sharpness of the result by proving some uh, showing some counter examples to show that you cannot really go beyond that quadrilateral. So you every counter example, if you build it properly, gives you an inequality between the exponents P and Q, a relation, and that inequality corresponds to an edge. So you need to build four counterexamples for each of the edges of the quadrilateral. Um, three counterexamples are straightforward generalizations of the Schlagsog paper from for the Euclidean, but one counterexample needs to be new. And this replaces what is usually, what is called a nap type example, uh, Euclidean example. And uh, I really just very quickly want to give an idea using pictures what might one might need by a nap type example because this really sees the curvature and uh, um, this is the uh, and uh, let me just say that the correct example in this setting is one where so how do you build counter examples you need to test your operator on certain nice simple functions the simplest functions are one which you build by looking at the characteristic functions of certain sets uh, so often what in that example, the best function you choose is often the characteristic function of a box. The dimensions of the box are chosen, uh, keeping in mind the curvature of your surface. And uh, usually in the sphere case, the correct, so you take your test function, you, uh, you, operate, you, uh, you apply your operator on the test function, you get another simple function, which is the characteristic function of another set. And for this, in the Euclidean case, both these boxes that you get, the input box and the output test box, uh, turn out to be of the same dimension. But the correct example for the Kurani case turns out to be one where these input and output boxes are of different dimension. And this different dimension actually matches the kind of imbalance scaling that I showed you earlier. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, again, what I just want to say is that that the, those calculations earlier, they're not just number crunching. There is something intrinsic here related to the Heisenberg group that happens. And the example really meets you there. So that's nice to see. So, okay, very quickly, what is what do I mean by a NAP example? Uh, maybe some of you have already seen it. So uh, how NAP examples want to measure curvature. How do you measure curvature of pieces? Uh, you put it in a box. And the idea is the more curvy an object, you know, would the thicker the box you would need to place it in, right? Because uh, if you uh, if an object is very curvy, then you cannot really put it in a very thin box for the same breadth. That's the idea. So, for example, if you were just looking at a line and you want to cover a delta piece of the line of breadth delta, so think of delta as something very small. So, delta square is way smaller than delta. Then it doesn't really matter how thick you choose your box. You can make your box as thin as possible. It would still be able to contain that entire piece of that line, right? 
But you cannot do the same thing for a circle, for example. So circle for me is essentially, at least here, a parabola. So something like this. And then, uh, so it's quadratic. And that really dictates the curvature. So it uh, you can, the least for a delta, in order to contain a delta length, the least thickness you, took, you can go to is delta square. Beyond that, if you try to make it thinner, it, some of the circle will escape. So in some sense, the, the, thick, the greater the thickness you need, the more curvier the object. This is the idea. So these are the kind of boxes. Uh, or yeah, one more example. If you have a degree four surface, then your object will become, box will become, can become even thinner, but there's still a limit. It cannot be infinitely thin. And this is the kind of box I would have expected to see for the Korani sphere, because it's like a degree four surface. Uh, so then how do you use these boxes to build counter examples? For example, if you are on the plane and you have the circle, uh, if you have the, uh, the circular maximal function or circular averaging operator, so you, you take your input function to be the characteristic function of this red set that, we ha that I have over here. So this is your input function. And now you test your averaging operator on this input function. And if you just analyze the geometry a bit, you essentially see that, so you have the characteristic function of the set, the f, and then you apply your averaging operator of say radius one on this f. Now, what are the points where this output function would be large? So the output, that's pretty much asking essentially, what are the centers of the circles which will really hit this box. So uh, pretty much the set of the centers of all circles of radius one, which hits the red box. And that turns out to be this set center at the origin. And the wiggle you, room you have is the same as the wiggle room of the input set. And that's pretty much because, again, when you move your circle around, it doesn't really change the shape. The curvature is the same. So the wiggling will not really affect anything. But for the Korani example, so this is what I've meant by imbalanced example, uh, the, the boxes turn out to be of different size uh, because when you wiggle your Korani sphere around, uh, the shape changes, it becomes more curvy. So for the same, uh, in order to accommodate the same red box, the, the green box has to actually be considerably smaller. Uh, and that's because of this, uh, of this curvature which comes up when you think, move around things. So, and that, that the, the, the difference in dimension really matches the scaling that you see. So, uh, okay, I said a lot of things, but hopefully there were some pictures, so. Um, okay, so let me just sum up. This is the last slide. Uh, so basically through the talk, what I wanted to show was this, uh, when you look at these this geometric objects like averaging operator on the Heisenberg group, there's a rich interplay between the group structure and the geometry of the sphere. And this really can prove helpful, this interplay. For example, it's because of the Heisenberg group that you really get the best possible fixed time L2 estimates. And this also influences the estimate at Q4. So at the Q4, unfortunately, the curvature still vanishes, but the, uh, the scaling argument is heavily influenced by this group law. And all of these curvatures that I kept throwing around, they, they, these mean something specific when you are looking at oscillatory integrals. So ultimately you can use that theory to be able to prove these theorems, which is pretty nice. And they're almost sharp, which is even nicer. So this is all I wanted to say. And thanks a lot for your attention. So how did you identify these uh, quadrilateral and the, and the vertices? Is it how did I? Were there some earlier indications? Uh, sorry, could you? Uh... <laughs> yeah, sorry about it. How, how did you identify the vertices and the quadrilateral? Did you have some earlier... Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah. So that's a nice question. Right. Uh, so uh, a lot of it is analogous to the spherical, Euclidean spherical maximal operator. So the picture you have over here, it's very, uh, you have the same thing in the, in the, the, the quadrilateral looks the same for the Euclidean as well, except the, uh, the co coordinates would be different. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, already that map was there that we should uh, get something like this. And uh, 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 the diagonal estimates were already known. So there was that. And then there was an anti-diagonal estimate, which also was not that difficult. But yeah, uh, uh, for the fourth, uh, uh, 
I, uh, I've essentially followed a prototype which is there for already for like the spherical uh, Euclidean spherical maximal function. But the analysis turned out to be different because of all this flatness and all. But in the end, it turned out to be sharp as well. So yeah. Going in, I was not sure if I would get a sharp result. And the example was also nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very also, this uh, this is uh, not the only spherical maximum function you can consider on Heisenberg group. There's before this, I'd worked with my advisor and another collaborator, uh, Yoris Roos, on uh, uh, another kind of maximal operator on uh, on the Heisenberg group. But you're not looking at a like a co-dimension one object, but a co-dimension two thing, which is so as an actual sphere, but limited to just uh, horizontal plane. So like in the in the two end coordinates, which don't see the chain, something like this. And this is a co-dimension two object. And uh, again, uh, we kind of used, we kind of went uh, in a certain way. And I tried something similar with Korani sphere, but uh, there were some different issues, but yeah. I have a question when I was not in the beginning of the talk. So I was asked for Yeah, sorry. For, yeah. No, sorry, I was not there in the beginning of the talk. But uh, my question is, is there anything specific about Heisenberg group? Uh, or yeah, that's a good metric space or this kind of uh, more general? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, you should be able to extend the positive result at least to even like Heisenberg type groups and uh, the others, uh, this, for example, uh, this other spherical maximal operator, we were able to take it <coughs> up to... Uh, uh, up to Metivir groups even. But uh, uh, so there's nothing really specific about the Heisenberg group, uh, uh, except there are two things. So one is I do need some kind of nice, uh, when I analyze the curvature properties, uh, I keep saying that the skew symmetric matrix is very important. And at least the way the proof works, I didn't really use the fact that it was skew symmetric and invertible. So maybe some kind of structure is needed. It might not, I mean, I'm not saying that this you absolutely needed it. Maybe even for some other matrices, you can do something, but this was needed. But uh, uh, but you can definitely do it for uh, maybe invertible matrices. I think you do need skew. Uh, at least my method would need that. Yeah. So you right. don't, I mean, kind of use more finer structure of the Heisenberg group. That's what you're sort of saying, if I understand. Yeah, yeah. In some senses, yeah. Like once we know that, okay, this is the group law, we kind of, Essentially, oh. forget that we are on the Heisenberg group. We are thinking, okay, we are on RN and we have this kind of group law. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Hi, Rajula, that was an amazing talk. Uh, I joined up a little bit. And uh, so I had a comment to make. Instead of the Heisenberg group, if one was using any sort of a nilpotent group over here, then as you said, I mean, all the translation properties would hold true. And one can actually go to a higher dimensional sphere as well and, and look at deformations of spheres, and that should still work out. Uh, I, I mean, are you saying, are you like, are you asking? Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, just making a comment. I don't really know how much this would hold true. Uh, just based on the equations, I think that should hold because the type of symmetry which you're using over here is a translation symmetry, right? And along with that, it has to have a chain variance with respect to that matrix, the skew invariant matrix. Uh, yeah, but I think at least the method I use, I really use the fact that you have this nice polynomial structure in some sense as well, like around the... Uh, uh, if, for example, when you're making, uh, when, once you make a tail expansion around the uh, around the uh, poles, then you do have this nice polynomial structure, which is quite amenable to scaling. So, for example, uh, if one was to have a so the polynomial norm, structure has to be homogeneous, right? I mean, uh, the scaling would be affected only by the homogeneity. If I'm not getting it wrong, uh, the scaling would be affected by homogeneity. That's true, but it's also like uh, very radial. Like if you were to look at a more complicated surface, like for example, people often ask me about this Carnot, Cartier-Diori metric spheres and yeah. all that. I think things can get quite complicated there. But yeah, as long as you have a nice scaling structure, it would should work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. At some point, you said third derivative was involved. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So, uh, okay. Uh, Right. So uh, 
I'm talking about cinematic curvature here. So, okay, now I can finally write maybe a facilitator integral operator. So, uh, essentially, what we'll end up doing is we will convert our analysis to these kind of oscillatory integrals. So, uh, the averaging operator will give us some kind of an oscillatory integral operator. So, you have a oscillating factor. There's a lambda. This lambda is that parameter to Rupa K I was talking about. And then you have a phi. Uh, it's x. It also, so there's a t here as well now. t, y, and then whatever, some nice uh, a, y, f of y, d, y. Okay. So uh, this is the kind of oscillatory integrals that we would be looking at. Uh, we want to prove this uh, uh, estimated q4, but uh, it's always nice to, uh, uh, we can reduce this estimate, not to uh, not the one q4, but some kind of nice estimate of the form uh, basically can reduce the question to mapping properties of T lambda from L2 to some another uh, thing Q5. And once you have that again by interpolation, you can get back to Q4. But the good thing about having an L2 on the left side is you can use TT star, which is a very nice technique you use. So what's the idea? If you want to uh, look at uh, L2 is a Hilbert space, uh, so uh, if you are looking at the mapping property of T lambda from L2 to LQ5, you also can look at the uh, adjoint this, which will map LQ5 prime, but back to L2, okay? And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the good thing, uh, but what if you compose these two operators? So you have, maybe I'm, uh, maybe it should be LQ5 to L2, maybe I made a miss. Okay, so, but you have a TT, Star, meaning you first uh, uh, operate this operator. So you look at, instead of just looking at the mapping property of T lambda, you actually look, compose this T and T star. So T lambda star, and then T lambda, right? And this you can only do because you have an L2 here, because you need the same space for both sides. And then you convert this question to actually looking at the mapping property of this operator, which is an LQ5 prime to LQ5. So this is the TT star way. And the idea is that if you have an estimate for this, then basically the estimate for the original operator is just the square root of the estimate for this. So, so but once you do this TT star, the thing is, uh, then you need to look at what, what the kernel of this new operator, which is the TT star operator. So you go back here and compose T and T star and see what happens. And what you end up seeing is a difference because of the, taking these adjoints. So what would happen is you would have a e to the power i lambda. And then uh, because of TT star, uh, you have a composition. So you would have uh, phi x1, t1. So this phase, for example, comes from, from, the, uh, uh, from, the, from one of them. And then you have a minus and another phase, which comes from the TT star. Uh, the T star. So these are the kind of oscillatory integrals you consider. So you start looking at differences rather than the original phase function. And the phase function is pretty much the uh, defining equation of this of this Kurani sphere. Now, once you have differences, so, so now I want to look at the curvature of this phase function, which is the difference. So difference is pretty much a derivative uh, up to some errors. So what you end up seeing is something like, maybe I can, maybe I can see that. You can insert a page. Yeah, okay. So what you end up seeing is uh, oscillatory integrals like this. So you have P, X1, uh, T. So you have a difference, but essentially you can write that difference as a gradient in X and T. P of some reference point dot uh, the difference x uh, one minus x zero minus x one t zero minus t one ratio. So now uh, I'm not analyzing my original phase function, but a gradient. And now when I talk of curvature, I will take two more derivatives, and that's how three derivatives come into the picture. Uh, and that's uh, also the reason why things uh, go bad because. Once you take three derivatives, the quadratic term really doesn't stop mattering really. And the, the bilinear form that I saw in the defining equation uh, uh, is only in the quadratic term. So this really goes away once you take three derivatives. And th then you need to really go into this 
uh, this fourth degree term and see what's what it's doing. So this is how three derivatives are coming in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.